So uh, I guess to start with the big question, what actually is this thing? It's, we hear about it all the time at the moment, artificial intelligence. What actually is it? And, and, and as Juliet said, what it's not. So forget Isaac Asimov and the Terminator and Cyberdyne systems. It's, we're not talking about uh, science fiction here. Uh, the slightly glib answer I give to family and friends when I'm asked this question, and this might be biased by my statistical background, is it's just a fancy name for statistical modeling. The mathematics has been around, in some cases, for 100 years. Um, the massive boom and change we're seeing recently is kind of more driven by the availability of data and processing power and, and, and data storage than actually by kind of novel techniques, although there are, there are new techniques coming along too. Um, and I guess a really key point that a lot of people often don't realize is it's already ubiquitous. AI is everywhere. Every single one of us uses it every day. Uh, if you use Teams or Zoom with the voice calls, if you blur your background, AI is doing that. When your camera auto focuses on you, that's driven by AI. Even Microsoft spell check is driven by AI these days. So we are all using it all the time. Uh, and now, apologies, the beginning of the Tuesday morning maths lesson. Uh, when I say it's all statistical modeling, what do I actually mean by this? Um, and when we deal with statistical models, we tend to kind of, there are lots and lots of different algorithms, but we tend to group them into two functions. Uh, and I like to think of these as in terms of what they're actually trying to do. So uh, unsupervised learning algorithms are designed to kind of spot patterns in data, whereas supervised learning algorithms are looking to predict the future. And I use inverted commas because by the future, I don't necessarily mean in time, but the future in terms of the data, stuff that the model hasn't seen before. Uh, the terms unsupervised and supervised just come from the fact whether we tell the computer the answer in advance or not. So to very briefly show how these work, if we have a data set like this one, every circle uh, represents an individual data point. Uh, to put this in context, let's say um, within a law firm, each point here is a, a matter that's been worked on in the last month, year, whatever. And on the x-axis, so along the horizontal, we have how many hours were spent by fianas working on the matter. And up the y-axis and the on the vertical, we have uh, how much turnover was generated, so how much money we actually got from, from that matter. And if we feed these data into a, a, an unsupervised learning algorithm, it might sort of cluster them a bit like this. And you might look at this and say, yeah, that kind of makes sense. From red through to green, we're going from kind of simple, medium, complex cases. And then we've got these kind of edge cases in, in blue and yellow, where maybe in blue, it was, I'm not sure for some reason, we've ended up with something really profitable. Uh, whereas in yellow, we're, we're spending a lot of time and not making a lot of money, and maybe we're a little bit worried about these cases. And this is really useful because the machine can just kind of highlight these, and we can look at them and kind of say, right, what's happening in yellow, and how do we get more of, of the blue, essentially? Uh, and that's all unsupervised learning basically works like that. It's spotting patterns in data. Supervised learning, very similarly, uh, we have a set of data points here. Um, in circles, and in this case, let's say that along the horizontal, uh, we're, we're, we're a big firm today. Um, we have each of these is a, a department within our firm. And on the x-axis along the horizontal, we have how many people that department employs, how many fee earners. And up the y-axis is how much revenue that department generates each year. Uh, and the red line that we can draw through this is, is our artificial intelligence model in this case, is that is that red line. And this is really useful because let's say we've got some money to burn and we want to buy a new department from somewhere, we're going and maybe merging with somebody. Uh, we could realistically say, if we know it employs this many people, uh, following patterns we've seen in the past, we could realistically expect to make about this much money from that new department we've gone out to buy. And you can see why this is quite useful in projecting forwards and predicting the future. Um, Obviously, these examples are a little bit trite and probably made more trite by me trying to shoehorn in to make them relevant to semi-relevant to law firms. Um, we wouldn't actually use AI in these cases, obviously. There's only two dimensions. We could do all of this by eye. AI really shines where we have lots of data. So rather than two dimensions, we're dealing with 10, hundreds, millions of dimensions. Um, which brings us kind of nicely to, I guess, the, the flavor of the month. Uh, models built, large language models like GPT, built on millions of data points. So I would guess if you're here, you've at least heard of chat GPT uh, over the last few months. It's, it's kind of inescapable in the news. Um, this is just a screenshot where I asked it a fairly boring question, I guess, but it gave a fairly sensible answer. Um, and I want to kind of draw 
talk a little bit about, about these large language models. I say other models are available. Google have one called Bard that's, that's fairly similar. And so you may have interacted with, with ChatGPT, but ChatGPT is actually, there's a, a bit called chat that sits on top of the really clever bit called GPT. And GPT is the large language model itself. Uh, and this is proprietary, so we don't know exactly how it works. Um, but it's basically a combination of lots of different statistical models, similar to, to what I was describing before, all working in essentially those same ways. Uh, and trained on massive data set, essentially the internet as of fixed dates. Um, and what's really kind of cool about these things, I guess, and, and one thing I, I've, I've been really amazed by is there are two ways to access GPT. There's the chat GPT, which I kind of think of as like the pub quiz version. It's really great if you want to cheat um, for your team to get that bottle of wine or something from the pub quiz prize. Um, and, and don't get me wrong, it's really cool. We've seen good stories and bad stories of, of things that people have used it for. But the real power for me of GPT is that OpenAI, the company that, that, that pro produce it, provide an API. Um, and for those who don't know, an API is basically like an access point in a piece of software that allows another piece of software to talk to it. And this is really, really powerful because you can essentially harness the power of GPT, that large language model, and integrate it into your own processes or products or systems. And to kind of test this, when I first saw that there was an API available, I kind of tried. I made a, a really shonky website uh, that would take user input on a specific question um, and would basically feed, kind of coerce that question that the user put in, send it to GPT and get a sensible answer. But it doesn't work like chat because it doesn't have a conversation and it won't answer questions not related to the thing that the website was about. So essentially I'm harnessing and focusing the power of GPT into a specific application. Uh, and it took me 45 minutes to do. And this isn't to say, look at me, I'm really clever, I could do this in 45 minutes. It's to say it's really easy to use this. Um, and this is really cool, right? This is, this is the democratization of AI. Um, these things, these large language models, they may have been around a while, but they've been the purview of nerds locked in university basements. Uh, now, nerds like me who have escaped the basement can use them. Uh, but really clever people are using them to be, build really cool products. Um, and that's, that's, you know, it's really exciting. I won't kind of go into them. I've listed some on the board, but I've spoken to people that are on the panel this morning, and they have way better ideas and way more knowledge about products coming up the road using AI than me. Um, but this, this point on democratization of, of, of AI is something I, I really want, it, want people to think about because it is, it's providing the power. You no longer need to be a data scientist or have access to these reams and reams and reams of data to use really powerful artificial intelligence models. I sit in the research team at the SRA, and we kind of ask ourselves, what does all this mean for, for the SRA, for the legal sector, for regulation, for society as a whole? And on this democratization point, we always kind of come back to the same, I guess, slightly tired pros and cons of AI that we've probably all heard of, of machine learning for, 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 for years. There are really cool products, really exciting stuff coming up the line that will change the way we work. And, and with those, all the kind of classic benefits of automating procedures, speed, accuracy of information, um, they're, they're the, the pros. There will just be more of them. Um, the cons, the same. We'll have, we've all heard of bias in, in models, right? To use a, an Americanism, garbage in, garbage out is a, is a kind of a phrase in data science. And it basically just means if your data are rubbish, your model will be rubbish. If your data are biased, your model will be biased. Um, the computer says no problem, I think, is a, a really key one. And for the legal sector, I'm particularly, I think this is particularly important. People, it's very well documented that people often switch off their mental faculties when a computer tells them to do something, even if they actually think about it for a second and would realize that the computer is telling them to do something really stupid. Um, and I think this is, from a regulatory point of view, this is our biggest challenge. Um, as AI comes in, people still need to engage their mental faculties and not just say computer says no. Um, and societally, um, one of, I, I think it, one of the top data scientists at Google recently said that as a society, we are really quickly reaching the point 
where we cannot tell the difference between what's real and what's been generated by AI. And as a society, we have no idea how we're gonna deal with this. Um, my favorite example of this, just, I, I like this picture, so I wanted to include it. Um, a few months back, I don't know who saw this picture. Um, it came up on my Twitter feed and I thought, oh, that's fun. Somebody sent the Pope out dressed as a member of E17. Um, it was only a couple of days later when I was reading an article that I realized that somebody had generated this by AI. The Pope hadn't starred in a Christmas music video from the 90s. Um, <laughs> and, you know, I deal with this stuff all the time and I didn't even clock. I didn't even consider that it wasn't a real picture. Um, so I want to kind of end and leave you with, with a sentiment that I think is really important is... This boom in AI is really exciting, but with it comes a lot of risks, and it is quite scary. And we shouldn't let either half of that sentiment distract us or, or make us forget the other half, right? So we shouldn't be blinded to the risks because the opportunities are really exciting, but we shouldn't seize the opportunities just because there are some really scary risks. Um, so I'll leave you with that. Thank you.